So tonight we're going to study the book of Revelation and we continue our series on the focus on, on our focus on Revelation with lesson 15, which is a lesson about Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to move this up here so I can see it a little bit better. All right, Revelation chapter 13. So one of the things that is very interesting in our world today is that there is always a question about whether or not the United States is in Bible prophecy. The United States is the world superpower. Some may disagree with that. Some may agree with that. But we all know that the United States is a superpower. And there's always been a struggle between God and Satan and, and that there is always this conflict that has started from the book of Genesis, started in heaven and continues today. And so we wonder if, if the United States is in Bible prophecy. And one of the interesting things here is that we're going to see if the book of Revelation reveals to us the rise of the United States and what will happen in the future. And so as we look into this, Revelation chapter 13 is a very interesting uh, chapter in the, in the entire book of Revelation. Revelation 13 focuses on these two beasts. We studied in the book of Daniel uh, four beasts, and we'll talk about those in a few moments. But here in Revelation 13, it focuses in on these two beasts, a beast that comes from the sea and a beast that comes from the earth. And so we're not going to have time to read everything and to dig deep into everything. But tonight we're going to go through uh, the book of Revelation chapter 13. We're going to look at it verse by verse. We'll read a few verses and then we'll, we'll understand what's being revealed in the passages. So sit back, get your Bibles, make sure you follow along with us as we dig deep into uh, chapter 13 of Revelation. So the Bible starts off here in Revelation chapter 13 saying, and as I stood upon the sand of the sea, here we find the revelator, John the revelator. He's been given these visions while he's been on the island of Patmos. As we, if you've been with us, you know that he started out in, in Revelation chapter one, where he's there on the island of Patmos. And he's receiving these visions from Jesus Christ. He's receiving these visions from God of the things that must shortly come to pass. And we see here in Revelation 13, John is seeing in vision as he's standing on the standing upon the sea, the sand of the sea, he saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. Ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which he saw was like unto a leopard. His body was like a leopard. Feet was as the feet of a bear. His mouth was as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. And, and as he was saying this, he saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed in all the world. I mean, all the world. This is a worldwide power. All of the world wondered after the beast, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? In Revelation 13, verse 5, it says, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened up his mouth in blasphemy against God. This is key, friends. He opened up his mouth in blasphemy to God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Verse 7, final verse we're going to read here in this passage. And it was given unto him to make what? To make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And so, friends, this is a, a marvelous uh, description of this power here. This beast with seven heads and has ten horns and crowns upon the horns. Looks like the body of a leopard. It has the paws of a bear. has has these this mouth of a lion. And we see it speaking blasphemy. So we're going to look at some, some important facts about this particular beast because we want to identify what this symbol represents. And so the first thing we're going to understand about this is that a beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom, a nation, and a, or a king. So this is remarkable. We're looking here at this beast. And so the question is, what is a beast? What is a beast? From the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17, the Bible says, And these great beasts, which are four, 
are four kings. And what does a king rule over? A king rules over a kingdom. A king rules over a nation. And it says here, that these great four beasts would rise out of the earth. And so here we understand that whenever we see beasts in prophecy, whether it's a bear, a lion, a, a leopard, we understand that the beast represents a kingdom or a nation. And so a beast represents a kingdom or a nation. And so the, the, the next thing we're going to see is that from Daniel chapter 7, that there were four beasts that was depicted there in Daniel chapter 7. And if you remember, these beasts were rising out of a great sea, as he saw in vision in Daniel. And we see here this beast in Revelation 13 rising up out of the sea. And so when we understand this, we understand that these beasts of Daniel chapter 7 tells us that a beast in Bible prophecy represents a kingdom. And we also see something here that out of one of them, the last one, the fourth one, was this little horn. And we don't have a lot of time to go into it right now, but as you see on the screen, we see that the little horn does the same thing as we see the sea beast in Revelation chapter 13, with a mouth speaking great words, rising among 10 horns, and it goes out and makes war with the saints and prevails against them. And so we understand that this little horn of Daniel chapter 7 is this same beast power that we see here in Revelation 13. The little horn is the sea beast. And so as we've looked at this, and this is all symbolism, where does the beast come from? Well, in Revelation chapter 17, it identifies that this beast is coming up out of the sea. So what does the sea represent? The Bible says in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth. And we're going to study this in just a few lessons where we studied over Revelation chapter 17 to understand this better, what the, who the whore represents and things like that. But the place where the horse sit is, there are people. The water there is people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so we understand here that water or a sea represents an area of many people, a populated area, a place where there's a lot of civilization that is happening. And, and another thing that we see in this passage is that there is a dragon. So who is this dragon? The Bible also tells us this. And friends, as we are studying the Bible, one of the things you want to understand is that the Bible can interpret itself. You don't have to go to the commentaries. You don't have to go anywhere else to understand the Bible because the Bible can interpret itself. Nothing wrong with the commentary. The commentary helps us. But the commentary should always point us back to the Bible. And the Bible itself identifies the symbols within it. And we see here that the dragon, the great dragon, was cast out in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. It was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. One of the things we understand about Satan, here in this passage, is that he deceives the whole world. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. So the dragon represents Satan. So the second thing that we're going to look at here, second fact we're going to see is that this beast, this beast or this kingdom performs or speaks blasphemy. Back when we saw the graphic there, we saw this mouth speaking great things, this mouth speaking great things and, and blasphemy, blasphemy against God. And so that was the little horn. It also equates to the sea beast. But we want to understand what does blasphemy really mean? What is it to blaspheme God? Well, Luke chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible says, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason in themselves, saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemies? And so this scene here is talking about Jesus as he is, as he is healing, and he, and he is causing someone to rise up from their, from their bed of affliction. And he's telling them, I think this was when the, the young man was caught in the, had the sickness of a palsy, that he told him to rise up, your sins are forgiven you. And so the scribes and the Pharisees say, whoa, 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 who is this who can, uh, who, who is doing this speaking on this blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So the first thing we understand that blasphemy means is to be able to forgive sins, that only God can forgive. Blasphemy, one aspect of it is being able to forgive sin as God does. But there's a second definition that goes along with it. Blasphemy is also when someone makes themselves God. We see here in John chapter 10, verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. So what does blasphemy mean? It says here, because thou, because that thou being a man makest thyself 
God. So we understand that blasphemy also means when you make yourself God or make yourself equal to God. And so we understand that this, this nation, this kingdom is going to be a blaspheming nation. It's going to be a blaspheming power. And so, friends, I want you to see this. And we'll talk about this some more as we get closer to the end. We understand that these powers that we see in Revelation chapter 13, these are not just political powers. They are religious powers because they inhabit or they talk about worship. The thing, the central thing that we will see here in Revelation 13 is centered around worship and that these beasts desire worship. So this nation here, this kingdom will have a leader who claims to be able to forgive sin. This is blasphemy. And blasphemy also says that this kingdom will be a leader, will have a leader that claims to be equal with God. So I took a look at some of the dictators that are here in the world today, because we know this is talking about the end times. And so I looked at Bashar al-Assad or Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin or even Kim Jong-un, who we know these two last two are in the news right now as we speak. Did any of these dictators or these kings ever claim to be God? They may think they're God, but they didn't go around claiming that they're God. And how many of them claiming to be able to forgive sin, not just of their subjects, not just of the people in their kingdom, but to be able to give, forgive sins for anybody and everybody in the whole world? None of these kings or dictators would do that. But there is only one king, one king present here right now who claims to be God and who claims to be able to forgive sins. Michael Mueller in, in his book says that there is a man on earth. There's a man on earth who can't forgive sin, and that is the Catholic priest. Here in the Catholic National Record, July 18, 90, 1895, it says here that the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of flesh. And so we see here, as we, we begin to, to move along and understanding this beast, this beast power, this kingdom, this kingdom, this, 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 this organization, we have here a leader who does blasphemy. So the third fact that we're going to look at is that the sea beast here, again, we're talking about the sea beast. The sea beast kingdom is combined with a church. And we'll, we'll see that more in Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. We're going to move on past this. The fourth thing we see here is that the beast dominates the scene for 42 months. Now, friends, as you look through the Bible, especially the book of Daniel and Revelation, there is a time period that is called the 42 months, or that is called the time, times, and half a time, or the 1260 days. And we studied these time periods in our past studies in the book of Daniel and here now in the book of Revelation. We see it shows up seven times in the Bible. And this fact here that we're seeing is that this time, times, and a half, and this 42 months, and this 1260 years, is 1260 days is the same time period that the Bible is talking about in Daniel and in Revelation. And so we had come to understand if we had the time, we could dig into this and understand that this the day for a year principle points us to the fact that these 1260 years, these 42 months point to 1260 literal years. And it begins in 538 AD and ends in 1798, as we will look at in just a few moments. It is in 1798. So, friends, these are some incredible facts. We're just a, just a few more facts we want to cover to understand who and what the sea beast is. Uh, number five, the fifth thing that we see about this beast is that it persecutes the saints. We see here in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, the Bible says, and it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. We see the same thing of the little horn in Daniel chapter 7, verse 21 that the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. In this passage here, oh, I know what happened. I got the wrong slides. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, we're going to go on. It says here, the beast here described is the papacy. Ever since the time of the Waldensians, this has been confirmed. The beast here is the papacy. But what adds to the difficulty is that during the last few years, some in the evangelical church, some of the evangelical church have not only let go of the right explanation of what this passage is saying, but it also has come to contend against it. And although ever since the time of the Waldensians, this has been confirmed, 
by the blood of so many witnesses for the truth, it has been sustained at great cost by the Reformation that the church, the church has persecuted only a Tyro. And I had to look at the word Tyro, only an imbecile in the church, in her church history will deny that. And when she thinks it is good to use physical force, the church will use it. And so back in times past, when Bible scholars and expositors were looking in and trying to understand the book of Revelation, they saw that the church, it was the church entity that was going about persecuting, persecuting God's people. And so, friend, there's been a year, a time of the dark ages, many of us would talk about, where the church went through its worst persecution of God's people. But yet we understand that this beast power will do the same thing or is doing the same thing. And this is how we identify it. And so the sixth thing that we will come to understand is who is the beast power? Who is the beast power uh, that that we are talking about here? So we want to look at some of these facts again. First of all, we understand that this beast power is a religious power. Verse 8 says that the beast receives worship from the world. It receives worship from the world. Another thing we understand is that it represents a political power because it has states, because it has crowns and thorns. It's a state power. It has crowns and, and thrones that it's there. Another thing we understand is it's going to rule for 1,260 years. This power is, is wounded and almost destroyed. We understand that these wounds would be healed and the power, the beast power will re reassert its dominance upon the world. And this power makes war or persecutes God's people. So many people wonder, who does this power represent? Who does it point to? So this would be an entity that is a church and a state. It's going to be a government that receives worship or the head of it would receive worship. And the only place on the earth where it is a it is a is a government, the Vatican, and it is a church. At the same time, we see that the Bible identifies the beast as the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and, and sometimes people just say, "Oh, why would you say that about Catholics? They're good people." And you know, I know that for a fact. I used to date a Catholic girl, and she was a wonderful, loving person. And so the Bible is not talking about people, but it's talking about the government. It's talking about the institution. It's talking about the entity. It's talking about the power that, that the Catholic Church represents. And we're going to get into it more because it's going to become even more clear as we go forward. Let's move on into Revelation chapter 13 and verse 10. I'm just going to read these passages here. We see here in Revelation 13 verse 10 that this beast power, he that leadeth into captivity will go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. And here is the patience of the saints. And we find out here that the Bible is saying that this, this beast power, this sea beast, was going to be wounded, mortally wounded to death, where it would almost die. We see this happen when the Pope went into exile in 1798. We understand the Pope was taken from his throne, taken from the church, and put into prison in exile, and there he died. And it almost seemed as if the church itself had lost his head, had lost his, his leadership, and had died. And it was going into turmoil. But we see from the Bible that it would rise from that mortal wound. We go on to verse 11. As we see this mortal wound happening upon the sea beast, the Bible then as John is looking at vision, begins to transition and see another beast rising. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And I always wonder, what does that mean to speak as a dragon? Well, we talked about it just a few moments ago. How is a dragon? What does Satan do? What does he, de he do? He does. He deceives. He deceives, my friend. So we will find out that this peace this, this beast power here that's rising up out of the earth that has horns as a lamb is going to begin to speak as a dragon. And this here, we understand that we're looking at the second beast, this beast that rises up out of the earth, uh, has, has, a, has horns like a lamb, but begins to speak as a dragon. And here we see an American bison. You know, this is one of the great uh, pictures that we see of a bison. Now, a bison is not a lamb, is it? 
Bison is nowhere close to a lamb. A bison in shoulder height may get up to 10 to 12 feet tall with an adult male bison. They are enormous creatures. They are very, they are very kind, but they be, can become very destructive uh, if you are, are, are putting them into danger. And so we see here that this beast rises up out of the earth. So we're going to look at some of the facts about this second beast that we see rising up out of earth. First of all, we understand it's a beast. That beast of Bible prophecy tells us that it represents a kingdom or a nation or a king. The second thing we see is that this beast rises up out of the earth. So if it's rising up out of the earth, it must be the opposite of the sea. And so as we saw this beast, the first beast rising up out of the sea, it's rising out of a place of, of population, of, of civilization, of places where there's a lot of people. The earth would represent a place that's unpopulated or sparse with people. Not that it doesn't have any people, but it has few people. That's not great civilizations. And so we will see that the earth represents a sparsely populated area when we're talking about the symbols in Bible prophecy. And so when we look at a map, and we find out where the first beast rose from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. We find that they they rose in the area where we call the sea or the eastern hemisphere of the earth, over in the Middle East, over in Africa, over in Rome. We see that it's rising up in that area. So we understand that if the sea represents that area of, of civilization, we find the Bible even begins in that area of, of the world over in the area of Africa and in and, and, and the, the Fertile Crescent, we see that the earth would represent a place of sparsely population. It would represent a place that's opposite of the area of the sea. And if we're talking about the Eastern Hemisphere on the earth, it's more likely that the Bible is letting us know that this second beast is going to rise up in the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas. And so this earth beast rises up the third thing that we see is that this earth beast rises up when the sea beast is declining. And so when the, 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 the earth beast is rising up, the, the sea beast is in its decline. It has received its mortal wound. It is beginning to go in decline. As we understand 1798, that at 1798, when the Pope was put into exile, Right before that, 1776, and some of the things that was happening in the Americas, we see this nation, the United States, beginning to rise to prominence. And this is an important thing for us to understand, that it began to rise in prominence. The fourth thing that we understand is that this nation would not be run by a king, but that it would be a democracy. How do we know this? Well, we understand that this particular beast does not have crowns on its horns. It has two horns like that of a lamb, but it does not have a crown on its horns. This denotes that it's not a monarchy where it has a king or a dictator, but it is that a democracy it is the opposite of a, of, of a kingdom or a monarchy. And so the next thing we understand about this beast is that it is a nation that is very young. The Greek here, when you look into the Greek and do research on this, you understand that as it says that he saw a second beast rising up out of the earth, it is the same Greek word that, that describes a plant slowly coming out and coming out with, with, that, with tenderly out of the earth. And if you have a garden, if, if you've ever planted seeds, you understand when you water it and you planted it and you have the sunlight on it, it begins to grow slowly but steadily out of the earth until it becomes a full-fledged uh, vegetable plant or a tree or anything like that. So we see here that this, this nation would rise up. It would be a young nation that would rise up. Uh, and, and it would be a, a, a nation that has horns like that of a lamb. So this nation would be a very young nation. And this slide here is, is something here. I was going to take it out of here, but it just kind of shows this kind of progression of nations that were rising up at the time that the papacy received its deadly wound. We see Haiti and Canada and Australia rising up after the, the papacy received this deadly wound. But we see this here in the United States rising right before it in very close proximity of the time that uh, the papacy was going into decline. And the second thing we understand is that the United States rises to a, a, a prominence of world supremacy. And so we know that this thing is a nation, as we see here in number five, that this nation was a worldwide influencing power. 
this nation would be able to tell all the world to, to worship the first speakers as we will go later on to this lesson. Number six, we see that this nation has Christ-like horns. And this is something that has always puzzled me and always uh, intrigued me, I should say, as we study this. You know, the closest parallel to this lamb-like horn in Revelation 13 is the ram in Daniel chapter 8. And, and we understand here from these two verses that this ram has two horns. One of them was higher than the other, but this ram has these two horns. And so this, this land beast, it represents a single nation. The two horns that it has within this single nation are two kingdoms, because we saw that in Daniel chapter 7 that these horns represent these different kingdoms. It represents these two kingdoms that coexist side by side on this beast. And so these horns are lamb-like. They're lamb-like, and they must represent two kingdoms that are recognized by Jesus, the Lamb of God. And so what are these two kingdoms? Well, we remember the time when uh, someone came to Jesus and wanted to, him, wanted to try to trick him into saying something wrong to get him persecuted and, and, and get him punished. They asked him about this coin. Should we give to Caesar the taxes that's due him? And Jesus asked for the corn, and, and he said, let me see the coin. And so he looked at the corn. He says, in verse 21 here, he says that, uh, that render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. Jesus recognizes the civil power. He recognizes the civil power of the state. And those things that belong to the state belong to the state. But he also recognized the kingdom of God. And those things that belong to the kingdom of God goes to the kingdom of God. And so we see here that these two horns coexisting on this, this these lamb-like horns at that, coexisting on this, this uh, earth beast, is two kingdoms that are represented there that we see a kingdom of nation and we see a kingdom of church at the same time. And so as we looked at these Different beasts that are showing up in the book of Revelation. We understand that the dragon, if we think about the religion of the dragon, would be someone who denies God, someone who is going against God. That could be closely related to an atheist. And we see here the sea beast, as we understood, it is papal Rome. It is the, the Catholic Church. It is this, this uh, system of religion that claims the the accolades of God, being able to forgive sins and to be worshipped as God. So what does the earth beast represent? It must be a religious power as well. And as we look at this map, and I know it's very small here, we look at all the religions of the world where they are clustered there. In the blue, in the blue, there is a, there is a religion that is dominant there in the United States, and that religious system is Protestantism. And so the, the earth beast represents Protestant America, Protestant America. So we want to understand who this, this nation is, that this kingdom, this kingdom must be a nation. It arises up out of a sparsely populated area. It rises up around the year 1798. It is a nation that is a democracy. And it also exercises worldwide influence. And the, the closest thing that we understand about this particular beast that we're seeing rise up out of the earth, it could be none other than the United States of America. The earth beast of Revelation chapter 13 is the United States of America. And the thing that's so important to understand is that the earth beast is representing the prominent religion of the United States of America. And with this understanding, we're going to see some, some incredible things revealed about what is going to happen in Protestant America. Protestant America will become uh, apostate Protestantism. As we go on, we'll see this. Revelation chapter 13, verse 12 says here, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Verse 13, it says, and he goes on to do great wonders. We're talking about the earth beast here. Great wonders so that he makes fire come down uh, from, he from, from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And so we wonder, uh, this thing that's going to happen here, that he is going to create an image 
of the beast. So the question is, what is an image of the beast? Revelation 13, 14 talks about this image of the beast. It says here in verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they, that they should make an image to the beast. This is important, friends. They, that the beast power tells these they, we always wonder who is they, <laughs> but the beast power tells or encourages them, them to create or make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword and did live. Verse 15, it says here, and, and he had power, the beast had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, this is very key, the image of the beast speaks and causes as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So friends, as we're reading here, we're understanding that Protestant America, Protestant America would one day go forth to erect something called the image of the beast. And I really do have our own slides. I got to switch out these slides. I really want to. But we're going to go on because I want to, I wanted you to see this imagery, but we'll, we'll talk about it in just a moment. One of the things about the an image to the beast and understanding what is the image of the beast, what is an image? A lot of times we'll see an image in a reflection. That is our image. When we're looking in the mirror, we're trying to see if our hair is done right. We, we look at the image that is reflected from the mirror. So it is giving us a reflection of ourselves. But also there's some things about an image where it is something that has the same qualities and same speaking and is from the same source. If you think about something, I, I was looking at this thing uh, earlier today where we talk about a father and a son and the son is a splitting image Splitting image. And I thought the word was splitting image of the father, right? He's a, he's a split. Oh, my son. I have a son who's, who's going to college. His name is RJ. He's Reginald Jeremiah. He has the same name. He kind of looks like me. He kind of acts like me. Sometimes I think, I wish he wouldn't act like me. But he acts like me because he is an image of me. He's, he's my son. And so they also, they, they say there's a splitting image. I thought it was splitting image. It's actually a spitting image. Spitting image. Of the father. But what I'm trying to make clear here is that the image of the beast is not necessarily that it's the same thing, but it is something that is just like the original. It is just like the original. And so we're going to see here that we understand that the first beast was a beast power that received worship. We understand that the second beast is also going to set up something where it will receive worship. There's always this question in our in our government about should there be a separation of church and state? Should there be a separation of church and state? Well, Thomas Jefferson in 1808, he says this, that erecting the wall of separation between church and state is absolutely essential for a free society. Thomas Jefferson is reflecting on the fact that when you have a monarchy, when you have a kingdom, and when you have a religious entity like the Catholic Church in charge of the state, it always results in persecution of those who are not part of that particular religion. And so Thomas Jefferson here widely saying that the direction of the separation between church and state is absolutely essential. But we are seeing these things happen today where there is becoming an erosion or, or a breaking down of the wall of the separation between the church and the state. And as we see here in this graphic here, we see that as someone is trying to put up the wall, there is someone trying to tear down the wall. And you see who's trying to tear down the wall? That person is the church trying to tear down the separation between church and state. And so the Bible here is showing or depicting that this, this beast was going to cause everyone to worship the image of the beast. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. It says here, and he causes all, both great, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so this is where we start getting into what is the mark of the beast? What is the mark of the beast? Well, first of all, it is the mark of 
the beast. And the beast that we're talking about is not the beast of the, the beast from the earth, but is the mark of the first beast in which the image of the beast is resurrected. So the mark is the mark of the sea beast. So we want to understand what this mark is. But one, one thing we're going to try to understand is what the mark is not. The mark is not a barcode. The mark is not a tattoo. The, bar, the mark is not a computer chip that's implanted a, under your skin. A lot of people say, oh, wow, well, we got to watch out for getting chips under our skin. I don't want a chip under my skin. I hope you don't. But that chip is not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is not the vaccine. It's not the, 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 the vaccine that we receive these that people received these past few years. It's not the vaccine. The mark of the beast is not 666. That's the number of the beast. So we want to understand what is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is something that contrasts the seal of God. We see in Revelation chapter 7 that the, 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 the seal of God is something used to seal the people, the servants of God, to prepare them for going through the time of trouble. And so this seal that God puts upon his people, the mark of the beast is the exact opposite, or it's a different, or it contrasts the seal of God. And we see here in Romans chapter 4, verse 11, that a seal or a sign is the same thing as a mark. We see that it's the same thing. And, and in verse chapter, uh, in, in, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, the Bible tells us, tells us what the seal of God is. It says here in Exodus 31, chapter, chapter 31, verse 13, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath you shall keep. My Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So, friends, we understand here from Exodus chapter 31 and verse 13, and there and it is in Ezekiel as well, that the seal of God is a sign between God and his people. It is the seal of God. It is the mark of God. And so we understand that the seal of God is the Sabbath. And so if we want to understand what the seal, if we understand what the seal of God is, then the mark is going to be something that is very similar, but it's going to be a counterfeit of God's seal. It's going to be primarily a counterfeit of God's seal. And God's seal is, is, is embodied in his Sabbath day. And so we see here from the Catholic record, we understand what the mark of the beast is. Because we want to understand, first of all, that the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. And if we understand what the beast is, we'll understand what his mark is. And so from the Catholic record in London, Ontario, September, September 1st, 1923, not too long ago, a uh, hundred years ago, actually, uh, the Catholic record says here that Sunday is our mark of authority. The church clearly says here what its mark of authority is, and that it is Sunday. The church is above the Bible, they say, and this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of that fact, that they have authority over the Bible. And there are a lot of quotes we can go through. We don't even have time to go through all of them. But we want to understand that there's a, an interesting contrast between God's seal and the beast mark. And so we understand that if God's seal is the Sabbath day, then Sunday is the mark of the beast. So the question automatically comes up, man, I go to church on Sunday right now. I, I worship on Sunday every Sunday. Is the mark of the beast happening right now? No. The, the mark of the beast is not happening right now. So, friends, understand this, that we've identified the beast, the sea beast. We've identified the earth beast. We understand that there is a mark of the beast that's here in, in Revelation 13, and that this beast is not, and this mark is not being imposed upon us yet. The time is coming when Sunday laws will be enforced in the United States. And this is something that is baffling. But friends, I tell you that this will happen one day because the Bible said it. We understand that these ancient kingdoms rose when God said they would rise and they fell when they would when they would fall. We understand that these things will happen in the near future. And we're already seeing signs of that. I think that the, the time of this pandemic has showed us that there can that the government can change, the entire world can change 
and almost a moment to where things are being enforced on us or mandated to us uh, as we speak. So this is not some, this is something that we thought would never happen or could possibly happen, but we see right now that it is very possible and plausible that it will happen. So there's a time coming where Sunday laws will be enforced in the United States according to Bible prophecy. So a lot of these notes here, we're going to skip past. Uh, and this is really not showing all of the slides that I have ready to present. Oh, wow. Um, so let, let me see if I can get on to the end here. It, it, is, it is there. Am I still sharing right now? I'm going to switch up the slides because I need to show you guys. Yeah, you're still sharing. All right, all right. So give me just a moment. I hate that this happened. But let me get this back up for us. Because this is important for us to understand here at the end. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So hopefully I won't go over too much of the same thing. So we talked about the splitting image of the beast. But here, this is what I wanted to share with you all. This, this, is, this is powerful. Uh, we see here in this picture of where the, the Catholic Pope, Pope Francis, comes before the U.S. Congress. And this is something that is unprecedented in, in, in the history of the United States and in the history of the Catholic Church to that, to that fact. Um, so there was something I decided I would do. I said, you know what? I wonder if this was the first time or the only time the head of a religious institution came before the Congress of the United States. And so you know who I was going to ask who would know the answer to everything? Chat GPT. Chat GPT knows everything. At least they think they does. So I thought that I would ask Chat GPT. And I asked Chat GPT this question. Has the head of a church ever addressed the U.S. Congress? And of course, Chat GPT came back with the answer. Yes, the head of a church has addressed the United States Congress on several occasions. I was like, wow, several occasions? And so it goes on to say that one notable example, so one notable example is when Pope Francis, the head of the Roman church, addressed the joint session of the United States Congress on well, September 24th, 2015. This historic address marks the first time a pope, now it says a pope here, a pope has ever before, has spoken before the joint session of the U.S. Congress. And I was like, wow, that is amazing. I knew that, but there's some key things here. So I said, you know what, ChatGPT is really smart. Let me ask ChatGPT another thing here. So as ChatGPT has any other head of a church besides Pope Francis, ever addressed the U.S. Congress. And it took a few seconds here, and then ChatGPT came back. Well, as of my knowledge, it says, as, as of my knowledge, cutoff date in September 2021, Pope Francis was the first and the only head of a church to address the United States Congress. No other head of a church had addressed the Congress prior to that historic event. So I was like, wait a minute, you said that it was one of many. That you know that there was there was other people, but we see here, according to history, according to what has transpired in the world, that uh, the Pope is the first and the only head of a government that is a church to ever come before the U.S. Congress. So again, we wonder the question about the the church or state. We wonder about that. We see here that that prophecy is being fulfilled right before our very eyes. So I'm going to get back to where we left off. And we're going to bring this to a close. We understand that Sunday is the mark of the beast. It's not happening right now. And that one day, Sunday would be enforced in the United States of America. So we wonder how can the United States of America, this champion of democracy and individual rights, ever erect such an institution where it would enforce Sunday worship and would uh, denounce any other forms of worship. How could such thing ever happen? The Bible lets us know that these things will happen, that the United States represented by apostate Protestantism. Protestantism here has changed, has morphed into something else to where it doesn't look that, like the Protestantism of old. Protestantism is protesting against 
the atrocities of the Catholic Church. Apostate Protestantism is coming in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. And so we see here that apostate Protestantism will form an image to the beast. An image to the beast represents the church state institution. It represents that church state institution. So here's where we're going to conclude here. Revelation chapter 13 is revealing what's going to happen in the future. Revelation 13 lets us know that there are these things, these powers that are coming into play onto Earth's history. And that worship is the central theme in the last days. Worship is the central theme in the last days. So we wonder what is going to happen here in the United States. We understand that worship is the key issue in Revelation chapter 13, and it will be the key issue before Christ comes back. And so the other question that we, we wonder is, does worship really matter? Does how we worship, does how we come to God really matter? From the book of Revelation, we understand that it matters to God. It matters to him. And as we get into chapter 14 and chapter 15 and 16 and 17, we will come to understand that worship is a very important thing to God. And that the, the issue of worship, it first appears in the book of Genesis, where we see Cain and Abel, where they were bringing their sacrifices as, as a momentum of worship to God. They brought a different form. One brought a different form of worship and the other one brought the type of worship that God wanted. We see that there's a conflict between worship in the very book of Revelation. And we see here, I'm sorry, in the book of Genesis, and we see in the book of Revelation that there will be a conflict of worship in the very end. Also, we understand that there is an issue between true and false worship. There is true worship that God uh, has asked us to worship him, how he's asked us to worship him, when he's asked us to worship him, and the means by which we worship him. And there's also false religion, which is where the devil is bringing in apostate Protestantism, where the devil is bringing in false forms of worship, false forms of, of, of times for worship, days of worship. There is this issue between true worship and false worship that we see here in the book of Revelation. And so the final question that we're going to really ask tonight, does, Matt, does worship matter to God? And friends, I want to let you know that worship does matter to God. How we worship him, when we worship him, uh, the, the things that we, we do, that he is prescribed in worship, that we follow those things that he has prescribed, is very important to God. God has showed us and told us here in the book of Revelation that worship will be an issue in the end. So the question here is, are we going to worship God according to the way that he is asked us to worship? Are we going to worship him in spirit? And in truth, as it says in the book of John, are we going to worship him uh, in, in, with our true heart? Are we going to worship him when we find out what truth is? And we, it's been revealed in God's word. And we understand that from God's word that we decide we're going to follow him no matter what man says, no matter what our family says, no matter what the government says, that we're going to follow him. Friends, this, 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 this study of revelation reveals to us that God is concerned about us, and he wants to let us know that there's going to come a time when our, our, our desire to worship him and to follow him is going to come to that test. Are we going to stand that test? We're going to stand on God's side, or are we going to stand on the enemy's side? Friends, I want to stand on God's side. I want to stand with God, and I know that Jesus loves me and that he died for me, that I may be able to worship him in spirit and in truth, that I may be able to have communion with him now and forever. And friends, God wants to have communion with you right now. He wants to be with you. He wants to. He wants you to be with him. And so he has revealed to us that things are going to happen before they happen so we can prepare, we can get our hearts in, in line, and that we can establish and keep that relationship with him. So, friends, I want to invite you to come into that relationship. If you've not already done that, and if you have already come into a relationship with God, to, to make that commitment to continue to worship God, to continue to commune with God, to continue to be a friend of God. And as we do so, that when the time comes with the mark of the beast, we won't be worried. It's not a thing to worry about. I'm not worried about the mark of the beast. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a strange thing. 
when you understand what the mark of the beast is, what you need to do is you need to warn others about what the mark of the beast is. You need to warn others to prepare for the conflict. You need to, to warn others to get their lives right and get connected with Jesus Christ. And so this is not something for us to be fearful of because we know it's going to happen. But God reveals to us as we get more into revelation that he is going to protect us from this time of crisis. And so friends, I want to encourage you to continue to put your hands in God's hands and continue to read the book of Revelation because there is more yet to come. And I'm looking forward to our next study that we get to into, I believe next week. So make sure that you come back and worship with us, that you uh, read and study the Bible with us and that you may become closer in understanding God's word.